Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sanjay Nadavajula. I'm the engineering manager of a project named Opni over at SUSE. Um, I was part of Rancher Labs, we got acquired. Um, Opni is a multi-cluster observability and AI ops project. Um, and so let me give some backstory on how we started and how we got to where we are today. So I started Opni off about a year and a half ago um, as an AI ops tool. The goal was to ingest logs and provide AI insights on these logs, um, basically highlight what are suspicious and anomalous logs um, inside of your Kubernetes clusters. So it was pretty neat. It, it was able to infer off of your control plane logs, which came through pre-trained models that we trained ourselves on the Kubernetes control plane. And it was also able to learn on your workload logs and generate mo models by itself and self-update so that these AI models adapt as you change, remove, or update your workloads. So we built this out, and um, we started showing it to people. And people started saying, we already have our own logging system. Can you build a connector for us so that way we can leverage your AI models? And then we were like, actually, we're kind of like building a logging backend under, this, under the hood. Um, why don't you just? Like you don't need a connector. All we, all you need to do is be able to set up Opni inside of your Kubernetes cluster. And similar to how Prometheus, um, you just install Prometheus into your cluster, and then you enable Grafana, and then you're able to look at your metrics. Opni similarly is you install it into your Kubernetes cluster, and you're able to generate the uh, consume these generated AI insights. And people were like, we already have our own logging system, and we were already going half halfway there by putting a logging back in there to, to begin with. So th then they started asking, can you fully develop that logging back end and let us use it for more than just uh, AI insights? So that's when the project transformed from just an AI, op AI ops project to a observability project. Then they started asking, um, can I send multiple clusters logs to your back end? So that's when we decided to make a multi-cluster observability project that comes with AI ops, and it's not only for logs anymore, it's for logs, metrics, traces, um, and so that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Uh, there we go. All right, so observability, there's three pillars of observability. Those are logs, metrics, and traces. Uh, observability data allows operators to understand what's going on in their clusters or their systems. Um, and I'm sure all of you know what logs, metrics, and traces are. Uh, traces include network logs, um, and all of these things require different agents uh, to run to be able to collect that individual data type. And you also need some place to send this data. So these, these places, um, these systems that can store and analyze these data, uh, we call observability backends. Um, and many people probably rely on SASs like out of you all, um, how many of you use something like Datadog or Prometheus, but just by a show of hands, like Datadog, okay, Prometheus. So we've actually seen that overlap, like people like to use both Datadog and Prometheus because Prometheus, uh, one, is open source, two, um, people are just very familiar with it. Um, and three, you, you kind of control your own costs. So there's like a cost objective there too. Anyway, a full-fledged ob observability system uh, consists of both agents and backends. Um, let's talk about observability agents. So what we have over here is the CNCF landscape uh, for observability and analysis. Um, at the top over here, we have monitoring. Um, this section right here is for logging and the bottom section is for tracing. So the top section for monitoring, most of you use Prometheus, um, it looks like, and also majority of the crowd is using Datadog. Um, so typically for something like Datadog, you install an agent into your clusters, and that agent knows exactly what endpoint to send your, your monitoring data to. So it's able to do this. Similarly, Prometheus, when you install it, you typically install it within a cluster and it self-observes that cluster. It picks up, it scrapes any Prometheus endpoints that exist within that cluster. Um, for logging, uh, most of you probably use, I, I actually, I don't know what you guys use. A lot of people that I've spoken to uh, like to use Splunk. Um, 
Some people like to use Datadog. A lot of people uh, like to use the hosted Elasticsearch open search now on AWS. Um, and some people like to set up their own Elasticsearch stack their, or their own open search stack. Open search is just the hard fork of, of the last Apache El Elastic. Um, Log DNA is pretty nice too. Um, so like, there's a whole bunch of different logging tools available, and uh, for a lot, for all, almost all of them, um, a lot of people like to use FluentD because it can send to multiple downstream uh, logging backends. Um, Grafana also has Loki, uh, which works really nice with Grafana. Uh, Loki is like their logging backend. Um, and then for tracing, the most uh, most talked about one is OpenTelemetry. Um, it has a lot of promise. It's the second most worked on project, I believe, in the CNCF landscape. Um, so there's a lot of work being done there. Uh, but OpenTelemetry requires developers to enable traces uh, and inject their, their modules with OpenTelemetry for it to be able to work, um, whether it's auto-discover mode or if they uh, natively use OpenTelemetry to uh, capture their traces. Um, my point with all of this, uh, actually before that, let's uh, go to the, okay, there we go, observability backend. So observability backend store observability data and allow users to explore and query it. So there's backends, agents, front ends. The entire landscape is composed of projects that are different components of a observability stack. No one project really allows you to do everything all in one, and any project that does is usually behind a paywall, and it's a SaaS. Um, it's part of the reason why companies like Datadog or Dynatrace or Splunk, they charge so much because they make everything easy. Um, if you were to go the open source route, um, there are all the components are there. Um, all of them are open source projects, but it is up to you as the user to set this up yourself, um, which is challenging. Um, Okay, so that's where Opni comes in, um, and I put a picture of an iceberg over here because I like to look at, at observability as an iceberg. Um, everything that you see in your logging, monitoring, and tracing systems is pretty much everything ab above the surface. You go to check it, to check the, the health and status of your clusters, your workloads, um, and you're not really taking a look at what's going on underneath the surface because no one really has the time to when you're managing a lot of different clusters, especially when observability data, it likes to emit a ton of data. Um, so like, say for like logs, um, typically no one looks at logs as a preemptive tool because let's say you have a million logs, you don't know what to look at. Uh, people like to use metrics as a preemptive tool because you have nice graphs that are fancy and nice to look at, um, and you can set like alerting thresholds for them. Um, but it's really hard uh, to use all of these like correlate all of these tools together uh, because they're all so disjoint. Um, so logging, monitoring, tracing. And so I like to say that uh, Opni allows you to see both above and beneath the surface to identify like what's actually going on in your clusters. So Opni is completely open source. Um, again, we're coming from R Sousa Rancher. So like all of our projects are open source. It's very easy to install um, and you guys will probably get a, I'd, idea of how that looks or I highly encourage after this to go check it out yourself. Um, it's easy to create and manage observability backends and agents. So when I say easy, it's literally just configuration that you can set up through a UI, uh, click of a button and everything's installed for you. And this is in the multi-cluster fashion. So you guys will get a, um, an idea of what that looks like soon. Um, it's multi-cluster and multi-tenant. So you can actually save a lot of compute and, and uh, compute memory and networking costs. Um, instead of, let's say you have 10 clusters, instead of setting up 10 different Prometheuses and 10 different Grafanas for each of these clusters, you can have one Opni cluster send all of your data to this Opni cluster and you get to manage it yourself. So you're able to manage both the clusters in terms of compute and hardware, um, as well as costs. Um, that's, which is something that you, it's, it's, it's hard to do if you don't have Opni. Um, it comes with AI ops included. Um, so in a later slide, you'll see like what are the different AI ops elements that we're working on. Um, it's Kubernetes first. And uh, lastly, I, I do work for SUSE Rancher. So there is a Rancher integration. It's even easier to use it if you're using Rancher. Observability without Opni. Um, 
this image shows your containers uh, hitting the bottom of the iceberg and crashing. Um, but it's expensive if, if it's a SaaS. Uh, the nice thing about SaaS is they're, like, they're very easy to use, they're reliable, and you as a user don't need to manage anything. Um, but inherently, you all are at a, a cloud computing conference, so like all of you guys like to manage stuff. Um, and so the idea of moving away from SaaS is, or at least moving away your non-essential workloads away from a Datadog or a Splunk um, can make sense for you, um, as it does for some of our users. Um, it's difficult to set up if it's open source. So I showed you guys the CNCF landscape. There's hundreds of tools and projects out there. Um, and there are many different permutations that you can use to set up your logging, monitoring, and tracing stack. Um, and so since you have so many different options, it's actually very hard to get started. Um, and it's difficult to create and manage these observability backends because if something goes wrong, then you have to look at what tool went wrong and tools um, are kind of disjoint um, and they don't work together nicely. Um, and AIOps is, is difficult. Um, my background's in AI and I can tell you that most of the AIOps tools out there that claim to do root cause, and root cause detection um, and like self remediation, uh, they're very primitive and uh, like point blank, they, most of them don't do what they claim to do. Um, especially because AI ops tools are typically connected to your observability backends um, and they don't actually manage the infrastructure. Um, so like self remediation is very difficult to do and that's kind of why we started this project at Rancher because Rancher helps manage your infrastructure. Um, and with a project like Opni, um, if Opni is able to tell Rancher that like a node has gone wrong because um, it's run out of memory, then Rancher can auto-provision um, a new node for you so that way you have more compute or memory, whatever hardware requirements you want. Um, so that's kind of where uh, the, the angle that we're attacking um, this entire space from. Um, Opni's observability backends, we have two right now. Um, uh, under Opni logging, we extend OpenSearch uh, to make it easy to visualize and analyze logs, traces, and Kubernetes events. So one thing about Kubernetes events is that they don't persist inside of your Kubernetes cluster. So let's say something goes wrong with your Kubernetes cluster and it's like, it's unaccessible. You can't really work back like why it became unaccessible or why it went down. And so one of the biggest things that we saw immediately when once we started developing th this is that we need to we need a backend that also persists Kubernetes events. So Opni does that for you. Um, you can send open telemetry logs uh, to the Opni agent, that, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And if you ship open telemetry logs to the Opni agent, it will automatically tag it um, as per like what cluster it's associated with, and then send it to the Opni backend. Um, it includes Kubernetes native RBAC configuration um, and and everything's Kubernetes native, so like um, it's highly configurable um, and you can size it and modify it as per your needs. Um, to enable uh, Opni logging, um, you will go to the UI and we'll walk through that at the very end. But in your downstream clusters, it's actually very easy to turn on and off logging um, because one of the challenges uh, with any sort of observability stack is you need to, let's say, clusters become important to you because you start running some workload on it um, and then you stop your workload. Maybe you don't want to run um, Opni or Datadog or any observability stack on it uh, while these workloads aren't running. And so Opni actually makes it very easy for you to turn on and off logging in your downstream clusters that you have the agent installed into. So we'll see that soon too. Um, Opni monitoring extends Cortex. So Cortex is actually a project that was created by Grafana. Um, they were using Cortex as part of their hosted Grafana um, before they switched to another uh, project called Mimir. Um, but anyway, we extended Cortex to allow for multi-cluster uh, long-term storage. So Cortex already allows you to do multi-tenancy, um, but multi-cluster is not baked in. So we extended Cortex to allow for that. Um, it's a long-term storage for Prometheus metrics. And um, yeah, it provides an API that's in that sits in front of Cortex, provides RBAC, um, and using the Opni admin UI, you can easily uh, provision like multi-tenancy and manage users. Um, and we'll see that too. Um, 
to enable monitoring in your clusters, it's the same as logging. It's with the click of a button, um, and you can turn on logs and uh, metrics from your downstream clusters. So the use of usage of Opni agent. So um, let's say you were to use Opni. Uh, the recommended approach is a multi-cluster fashion. Um, of course, you can do a single cluster uh, approach as well and install op. So I'll describe the single cluster, and then we'll move to the multi-cluster, which is what's on the screen right now. So in single cluster, you have your workloads running. And let's say you want to experience similar to what Prometheus gives you. You can install Opni, enable logging and monitoring within that cluster and it will auto-observe the cluster that's in, that it's installed into. Now, let's say you want multi-cluster. You set up Opni, and you expose its services to the outside world, um, either through a load balancer, ingress controller, however you want to, um, and open it up to the outside world. And then you would install Opni agents into your downstream clusters, and then tell the agents um, in your Helm installation, or you can install it through the Rancher UI, um, tell it where the upstream Opni sits, and uh, it will start shipping over logs, metrics, or traces, depending on how you configure uh, the agent. And all of this is done through a UI minus the agent installation. So once the agent is installed, it starts speaking to the Opni gateway. And um, it, within the Opni admin UI, that's when you tell a downstream cluster to start shipping over logs, metrics, or traces. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Then can I have this uh, upstream, um, whatever the component and the dashboard and the agent on the same cluster? Yeah. Uh, ju yeah. Uh, just to repeat that question. So the question is, let's say you have an upstream Opni cluster, and you want the dashboard to exist only there uh, because, like, you have no downstream clusters. This is basically a single cluster mode that I was just describing. Um, so a single cluster mode. Uh, can auto-observe the cluster. Let's say your workloads are running within the ops upstream Opni cluster. Um, that would be the use case. Like, you would come with the dashboards and you would just enable it into the local cluster. Okay, so the Opni upstream architecture. So we used a, a bunch of the open source um, projects that was in the CNCF landscape, and we configured it all uh, so that way it's you don't need to. Um, these are all of the different elements um, that you as a user would have to configure yourself if you were setting up your own HA uh, observability stack. Um, and so I'm not going to get into this right now. This is uh, also on our website, so you can go check it out and just uh, ping us on Slack or create a GitHub issue if you have any questions. But the point with this slide really is um, observability stacks are hard to set up by yourself, and Opni really makes it easy. Go ahead. Yeah, right. Correct. Yeah. Um, it actually, so the Helm chart installation installs Opni, which is bare bones. When you install Opni, it comes with a gateway as well as the admin UI. So you go to the admin UI, and then you would enable your backends. So you would enable your monitoring backend. So it's actually even easier than. Um, Configuring everything via like your Helm values. So as long as it meets a, the question is, if you already have Prometheus running in some of your downstream clusters, can you use those existing Prometheus instances to ship those metrics over to an upstream Opni? Uh, the the answer is yes. Um, if you're using a specific Prometheus version, that version is uh, we detailed it in our website. Um, you can use Remote Write to export those metrics out. Um, the Opni agent architecture is a little bit more simple. Um, so we actually install Prometheus uh, in agent mode and Remote Write it to our Opni agent. Opni agent writes it to our gateway, which is not pictured here. Um, that's for metrics. 
For logs, um, we install Rancher Logging, which is actually just FluentD uh, operated by the Bonsai Cloud logging operator. Um, then we ship it, like we send those logs over to a Opni shipper, and that Opni shipper takes care of both logs and traces and ships that over to OpenSearch, which is our logging backend. Okay, so the Opni admin UI. So once you install Opni, um, you would navigate over to this page. And on this, uh, this left-hand side, you see a couple different things. So you see your clusters. These are all your downstream clusters that are registered to your uh, upstream Opni instance. So in this example, uh, we have three downstream clusters, and we have the local cluster as well. These buttons right here, um, so if, if the downstream agent um, signals to us that it's in the ready state. That means it's connected to upstream Opni. And you can click these buttons to install monitoring or logging in your downstream agents. Um, and it's literally just a click of a button. And if you hit that, uh, then like it will install the logging capabilities in the downstream agent and start shipping that up to upstream Opni. Um, and you can turn on and off um, these capabilities however you, you like. Um, you can manage your backends over here. So there's a logging monitoring backends. Uh, you can configure your logging clusters however you like. Let's say um, you have a ton of different clusters, um, downstream clusters that you're going to send logs from. Um, you can increase your ingest nodes for open search uh, quite easily. Um, and so you can scale down, uh, up or down your logging clusters or your monitoring clusters um, very easily using our UI. Um, lastly, uh, I haven't talked too much about this yet, but uh, we did introduce SLO capability for, as part of our Opni alerting stack. So you guys will, s right now we're on v0.6, which we just released this past week. Um, for 0 0.6.1, uh, we're going to have a UI for alerting backends too, so you can uh, configure Slack or uh, email or other um, alert manager backends easily through our UI and set up SLOs so that way if um, SLOs are breached, um, then you'll get an alert in your configured alerting backend. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the AI ops. Uh, just let me quickly do a time check. So um, we have a few more minutes left. So uh, Opni AI ops, this is how the project actually first started. Um, so we really focus on log anomaly detection initially because um, if you go to any of like the forecasting libraries or met anomaly detection libraries that are out there today, almost all of them focus on metrics. They're all numerical based and nearly none of them are textual based. And pretty much none of the open source libraries that are out there um, are good for log anomaly detection. In fact, I think we must be one of the first that is out there for log anomaly detection. Um, so we really focused on that because we found that in practice, metric anomaly detection doesn't, doesn't work. Kubernetes clusters, um, by nature, you deploy workloads onto them and then you remove workloads. So there is no predictability uh, per se unless you're running one workload all the time and that's the only workload that you're running. Um, if that's not your use case, metric anomaly detection will not work and we found it that that, that's, the, that's the case. Um, so we focused a, a lot on log anomaly detection. So for log anomaly detection, uh, we pre-trained a couple different models. Uh, we, tr we pre-trained a couple models for the control plane, um, rancher, uh, like the rancher system itself, as well as Longhorn. Um, we previously had a capability where it can self-learn your, your own workload logs. We're reintroducing that capability in uh, our next release as part of 6.1. If you have a GPU, you can leverage um, this uh, self-training mode that Opni provides. Um, the other pre-trained models that we have, they're all deep learning models, uh, but we've optimized it such that it can run on your CPUs uh, just as efficiently. And this is due to the fact that logs are repeat a lot in nature. So logs, uh, we boiled, let's say you have a million logs, we boil that down to like say 100 or 1,000 log templates and we actually make our inferences based off that. So we've made a ton of uh, efficiency Im improvements um, and kind of tricks uh, to have this deep learning model which typically runs on a GPU to be able to run on a CPU just fine. Um, 
So that's, that's where Opni AI Ops currently is. Uh, what's, what we're working on behind the scenes is we previously also had a metric anomaly model. I know I just bashed metric anomaly a lot right now, but we, we developed that because um, it's something that like, a lot of users like to see because metric anomaly forecasting is, is nice to look at um, in a GUI because like, you see like, upper bound thresholds and lower bound thresholds, and it looks like the AI is actually doing something. Um, so we have that implemented into our system, but when we reintroduce it in a future release, um, probably before the end of the year, um, we're not going to include it as part of um, Opni monitoring. We're going to uh, integrate it into Opni alerting. Um, and so the reason for this is when the users set SLOs up, um, and we'll talk about SLOs, uh, I hope, I'm not sure if all of you know what SLOs are, but when a user sets up an SLO, uh, the metrics that are associated to the service level objective uh, are important to the user, and uh, our metric anomaly models will only run on those metrics, not all of the metrics that they were previously running on. Um, and then tracing, uh, we have a root cause detection um, solution in the system. Uh, we are, it's still, we're, we're running through it and smoothing th some things out. So we are going to introduce a root cause detection uh, module um, in the future uh, if you have tracing capability enabled. Oh no, give me one second. Okay. Opni alerting and SLOs. Um, since we're running very, very low on time, I'm going to quickly run through this. So um, Opni alerting is going to allow you to create and manage alerting backends and SLOs uh, quite easily. Um, there's tools that are specifically meant for this, just like the other parts of the observability stack. Um, so we're going to make it easy, like we're going to slap a a UI on top of Alert Manager to e for you to easily configure your alerting backends. Um, this will integrate with all logs, metrics, and traces and work very smoothly with the rest of the Opni system so that way you can set up thresholds um, on your observability data as well as the Opni AI insights that are generated. Um, and so with that, let me, let me show you guys uh, what Opni actually looks like. Okay, so this is what the Opni admin UI looks like. Currently, I have the local cluster, which is what upstream Opni is installed into, and I have three downstream clusters. Um, these three downstream clusters all have the logging capability installed into it, and uh, all three of them are RKE1 clusters, um, Rancher's Kubernetes engine. Um, the upstream Opni that I have uh, this installed into is an EKS cluster, and I will show you what the logging backend uh, looks like. So this is where I set up the logging backend. Um, this is where I'm externalizing um, this backend. I have created three control plane nodes, uh, three data nodes, and three ingest nodes. Nodes. Um, they actually just run as pods, and then you can uh, turn on for the control plane. This is all related to Open Search, so you can configure your Open Search cluster in any way you easily through this UI, um, and then enable the Opni dashboard, um, Opni logging dashboard. So let me show you what the logging dashboard looks like. Um, so this uh, URL is actually live right now. If you guys want, you can go and check it out yourself on your, on your cell phone or computer. The login password is admin admin. Um, so this is the discover page for logging. Um, and so if you, if, as an operator, if you come to this page and uh, you look at your logs, you don't really know what's going on with your clusters, um, which is why we created the Opni AI Insights dashboard here as well. So if you navigate over to the Opni tab, um, you'll see the Insights dashboard. And I'll let it load up. And I actually injected a failure into each of the three clusters. Um, 
as a user, if you were to look at your clusters, um, these are the three right here. They all say that they're inactive and there's nothing wrong with it. But actually what's going on behind the scenes is um, the Kubla is freaking out on each of the three clusters and this is due to a memory leak um, that's going on in all three of the clusters. So our pre-trained models catch this and um, are able to alert you that like something's actually gone wrong. Um, your Prometheus matrix likely will not catch this um, and we've run out of time so I can't show you that dashboard today. Uh, but your logs and it's uh, unless you are manually looking through your logs, you won't be able to catch this. But with us, we'll catch it for you. Um, so with that, I've run out of time, but I highly encourage you guys to join our global online meetup in two weeks, um, and we'll do a lot more deep dive into some of the different technologies that we have in Opni. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Sanjay. Does anybody have any questions? I know we had a few taken during the during the talk. Super. Well, thank you, Sanjay. Thank you. Um, we have a 10-minute break, uh, and then the lightning talks will start at uh, 5.40. So you have a few minutes, take a deep, deep breath, um, and then we'll wrap up for the day with the lightning talks.